Welcome everybody to UFO Man Live. My name is Tim or UFO Man. And tonight we have a very special guest by the name of Luigi Venditelli. I hear some uh, static somewhere, guys. I hear it too. Not me. Everybody mute uh, and one at a time, Luigi. Okay. All right. Unmute one at a time. Okay, it's gone. No, Luigi, mute again. It is coming from Luigi. It's coming from me? That's weird. No. It's Gigi. Gigi. I was going to say, Gigi, it's, me. It's, it, it, it's usually me. I, I got you. Did, did okay, anyways, come? guys, we're, we're just experiencing some sound difficulty, and once we get it corrected, we will get into our live stream. There. Okay, tonight we're featuring Luigi Venatelli, who is the executive producer and the director of a soon-to-be-featured worldwide documentary and virtual uh, experience about S4. Um, and uh, I lost my train of thought, sorry. <laughs> Anyways, he is here tonight to discuss the documentary, and we would like to uh, show you his trailer for his film so you get a, an idea of what we're going to be talking about tonight. So here we go. Uh, there's really no way I can prove it without revealing my identity and getting myself into more trouble than I have already. Exactly what's going on up there? Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin and uh, they're basically being dismantled. Uh, some are, well, in various stages of, of completion built from other parts and they're being test flown and uh, uh, basically just analyzed. I was 29 years old working on the most incredible project in the history of the world. No one has ever been able to show exactly what I saw with my own eyes until now. Let's travel back in time to December of 1988 when this all started. Very well done. Thought that was I a love great it. trailer. Great. <clears throat> yes. Totally. Makes me um, want to watch it. Yeah. And didn't you say uh, recently that the uh, full trailer is coming out soon, Luigi? Yeah. That was the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that was the uh, teaser trailer that we came up with. We wanted to do something really fun. We, we thought that this was a serious project. We wanted to bring a little bit of fun into it. And for the longest time, I was like, how do we bring people back to 1988? How do we do that? You know, and something came up and somebody brought it. It showed up on my computer that they somebody rents the Back to the Future DeLorean. And I'm an, I was born in the 70s, grew up in the 80s. Yeah. And that is, without a doubt, the most iconic vehicle ever in Hollywood. You, there's no, there's no vehicle that beats the DeLorean time machine. Actually. Not even the Ghostbusters, like the one. Exactly. No right. way. No. What yeah. else? Knight Rider. Not even. Yeah. Nothing. It, it, nothing. Yeah. So nothing. I, I reach out to them, and the guy who owns the, the whole company. I, I say, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with this guy, Bob Lazar. I was thinking of bringing the car out to uh, a desert. And he goes, well, not only do I know Bob Lazar, he, he goes, I used to work at Groom Lake at Area 51. 
And this is the owner nice. full rental for wow. the United States of, of the time machine. I'm like, you're, you're kidding. So we, I, I called Bob the, the same day. I said, Bob, would you be interested in coming out to the Nevada desert near area 51? And we bring out a DeLorean time machine from back to the future. And we just film you going back in time. And I said, and you would, and I, and he finished my sentence and he says, and I would say I'm Bob Lazar and I'm going to bring you back to 1988. And I said, exactly. He says, let's do it. So it. we had such a great time doing that. It was, it was really just meant to give everybody a tease, a little bit of a tease of we're going to, we're going to take you back in time. And now we're going to bring out this real movie trailer that should be coming out very, very soon. So look out for it real soon. And that trailer will be showing you some really incredible cinematics. Like some of the stuff you'll see are absolutely stunning. And I'm not saying that because we're doing them, it's just because they really are. I keep seeing them with the team and it's, it's, it's really something. So I can't wait to, for everybody to see it. That's good. Nos. Um, when does, when does post-production work in for you? Well, that's a good question. It uh, really depends on, there's a few things that we're working on that have, well, there's, there's different levels of what we're doing. So mm -hmm. we finished interviewing. So that's been done for a while. We've got hours and hours and hours of interview and we've already cleaned up, you know, the footage we've, we've selected what we, what it, it's really hard, by the way, because the interviews, you got to cut out so much to fit it into like a movie. So it's so difficult to see some stuff go and go like, oh, damn, I wish I could have. So I might have a director's cut that eventually comes out, has more. Yes. 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 That'll be good. Yeah. yeah, yeah yes, there's just so much good stuff that we're going to unfortunately not be able to put in the first, you know, in the, in the yeah. movie. Uh, and then there's the VFX shots. So the VFX shots. And that's what takes the most amount of time in the in the post production. So, we're we're creating very very uh, elaborate shots. Some of the stuff is not just using Unreal Engine because, as you guys might know, we're using Unreal Engine five. Uh, we're using Unreal Engine five, Blender, Luma AI, Reality Capture, MoCap. We uh, you know uh, MetaHumans. We have a whole and there, there's other softwares that we're using. The 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 tech is evolving literally as we're doing it oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah and so sometimes we'll have a shot made and then there's a new update in the in the tech that makes us go right. wait go do that again you know and then we have to redo the shot but it looks so much better so we're like okay you know what let's do it let's take the little bit of time so it's it's a little bit of back and forth with the vfx and it's because we want to deliver something that is world class. So it's, yeah. it just takes a little bit more time. I'm hoping, I'm hoping, I'm saying this with fingers crossed, toes crossed, my legs are crossed, everything is crossed. I'm hoping that everything is finished in April. Okay. That'd be awesome. Oh, nice. Yeah. Because there's a lot that we've already completed. It's just a question of putting all this together and, and then making sure that the emotion is there. I I'm, I'm very, oh, yeah. I, you know, the music, the emotion, the, the imagery, the scene. So we want to make sure that it's like top notch so that everybody just gets immersed. We we're, we're not, you know what? We're not even targeting you guys who love this stuff. And we're not targeting most people who know about the Bob Lazar story. We're talking, I'm always telling my team, we got to target the people that have absolutely no idea. no idea what this is all about. And we right? got to make them, whether they believe it or not, we got to make them go, wow, you know, like, look at this. Because it's, it's such an important topic. And we've been, we all know that this is real. We all know this stuff happens. We all know that. But it's been such it's it we have not seen a hollywood level investment in this we've okay. seen it for sci-fi you know like you right. can have like flying saucers and stuff in sci-fi that that's just 
that bores me to be honest because it's you know it's not what actually happened it's been done <laughs> yeah and we want to see real investments made on something that happened so that yeah. we can get the opportunity to see it for for once they're never going right. to really show it to us so let's create it we have the tech let's do it yeah so right. that yeah and you have the horse's mouth too that's right you know? Right. right. And see, I just, I, I think about that and I think about the capabilities of Unreal Engine 5 and all the work that's going into creating these scenes and everything. You know, I get my notices every time UE has an update. Um, and I think about it and think that, you know, get enough attention and everything going, not just on this project, but everything else that generates interest in the community leads back to the project. Right. And being able to sometime put online a virtual reality immersive experience for them with the assets you already have. Oh, that's 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 actually happening. I mean, there yeah, there's that's part of the project. Yeah, the, the project, the project actually, you see, the name of the project is Project Gravitor. OK, right. And there's a lot of people who don't like that name. I came up with the name, so I force everybody to have to like it. Okay. Oh, <laughs> so there you go. Uh, I think it sounds cool. I think it's cool. Yeah. And, and so Project Gravitor, the name came out because uh, when 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 we were talking, I was talking with Bob. You know, there's two things that are related to the craft. One is that it uses gravity, or that they what they understood was gravity, and two, it was ancient. So you know, dinosaur, gravitor, and that's where oh, okay. that you know, so that's where that yeah, came. From. So I I, I brought I I, I, yeah. So Project Gravitor is the umbrella of this whole thing, and and within Project Gravitor, there's the documentary film called Lazar, the Original Whistleblower, which is what we're talking about. Since we created Groom Lake, Papoose Lake, the Papoose Mountain Range, S four, the whole thing, well, it it automatically provides. A, a virtual reality environment. So we we yeah. basically are doing that in tandem. So it's like a it's like a, 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 a two things are being done at the same time in reality. And so once the movie is launched, it will provide my team the time needed to no longer have to be on the movie, but right. to, to basically right. finalize the VR experience. And the VR experience is going to be so, I, and I, I consider it to be like the, the coolest thing. I've seen part of it. It's, I mean, you can't, it, even if you don't believe in this stuff, you still want to go there. You know what I mean? Because yeah. the idea yeah. of Area 51, you know, for, for, for so many decades, people are always, well, you know, what, what are they talking about when they say, what's the mysteries of Area 51? Well, you can now walk into this hidden base inside Area 51. And as boring as it is, because I will say, Bob, you, Bob said all the time, it was really boring. He says, besides, the, besides what was in there, he goes, there was not anything exciting at S4. It's not like it's, not like it's a exciting environment. It's a very dead, desolate, ominous environment. So the 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 cool thing is that you're going to experience that exact feeling that that government building government military feel the 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 security parameters the the guards that are going to be there that are going to tell you to you know walk there and don't do that and scream at you which what they did you'll be able to you'll be able to go to the nurse station you could fiddle around with some of the stuff in the nurse station there's that liquid that they made them drink you won't be able to actually drink it, but you could pretend you will. Yeah, you know, there's there's uh, the briefing documents in the briefing room in the briefing uh, room, so you'll be able to go through some of those. There's Project Galileo, Project Looking Glass, Project Sidekick, and there's a whole bunch of stuff on the U.S. Uh, Navy. It, they were all U.S. Navy top secret documents. So there's a f things in there about the Zeta Reticuli star system. There's stuff about craft, the the autopsy images that he saw. Were, recreated all that then there's the propulsion lab which is a kind of a boring room but a very fun room if you know what you're doing so 
it's it's like when you look at it, you know, somebody looks at that, it's like, okay, what do I do? You know, but if you know that that gray thing on the table can create gravity, well, if you paid attention to the movie, mm -hmm. you'll know how to put it together and and freeze the candle. You know how the, uh, there's a, a time where they froze a candle in, in, mm -hmm. in place? You'll be able to do that. It'll mm -hmm. actually work. Uh, you, you'll be able to throw a golf ball at it and it'll bounce off the gravity field around the hemisphere. You'll be able to play around with, with you know, the actual, you have to know how to turn on the reactor and turn off the reactor. So that's like by rotating the emitter that's inside the lab. So these are all things that are fun because once you get to know how that works, I mean, it is cool because it's ET tech. It's like, imagine having an opportunity it's always great. It's like it's like being in school. Your teacher tells us how to do something, but we don't really get it until we actually physically do it. So yeah, it should stay it. around and go, oh, that's what he meant by rotating the emitter. You know what I mean? So yeah. it, it's good to do that because it's an education. It's an educational process at the same time. And once you figure that out, which is pretty cool, you could either leave it there, the, the reactor, you can leave it in the in the propulsion lab or take it with you and go into the uh, hangar and walk all the way and go up the little steps, bring it into the craft. It's a very uncomfortable procedure because you have to put it down and you have to crawl into the craft because the, the, wow. the slanted body of the craft was not designed for a I mean, I'm 5'7". I'm pretty short for uh, for a guy. I mean, there's if you're looking at 5'10 or 6' or whatever. So anybody who's anything taller than I am, which is a lot, it would have to crouch down, get on all fours, and crawl in until the ceiling slowly starts to get higher and higher, and you could finally stand up towards the center of the craft. And that's where the reactor goes. So... That experience, I did it. When you do that experience, you really, really get an incredibly clear idea of what Bob meant when he said it was very small in there. Because a lot of people say, "How you know, it's a 52 yeah. foot diameter craft. Why would it be small? Well, you got to go in there to understand. And you you actually get to, to see the dimensions and you go, yeah, this was not made for us. This was made for something right. much smaller. Yeah. Much so smaller. it's a very, it's going to be a really, really cool experience for people to do, you know, and, and activate the craft, obviously. Yeah, I'm looking William. forward to it. William. Yes. Did, um, so did uh, Bob ever give any idea of how old these crafts were exactly that he thought maybe they were? Or, or well, that maybe yeah well he uh the only thing that he was he was told now this was not something that he read so it's mm -hmm. very important to note that this information was given to him verbally and not was not part of the briefing documents okay that one of the crafts potentially the one that we that he was working on was uh, found in an archaeological dig and was potentially 10,000 years old. So it, it, and that's where the ancient comes in. And so it, it really is very, very interesting because we, he always said, you know, a lot of people say Bob worked at S4 where they had all these crashed saucers. And Bob always says they were not crashed saucers. They were intact. These were not, they didn't look like they, with the exception of the one that he saw was the top hat. It looked like a top hat, you know, like the old 19, I guess a yeah. straw, a straw hat. Right. It said it had a hole that was, that was shot or looked like something shot through it. Yeah, that's right. And part around it. He said that obviously had damage to it because he says i saw the damage to it you will see that also in our in our uh in our film and the experience but he says i don't know if that was because they shot it down or they were just testing to see the the the, the structure of the craft if it could take you know a hit or not so 
he says, but it didn't look like it crashed. So it's it was still intact in, in its in its shape. So he never he never um, a lot of people. There's a big misconception about S4 out there where people think that that's where they brought the Roswell crash or that's where they have all these crash saucers. He literally said they pretty much looked all intact. So, you know, it, it's 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 he, he goes, I don't know if there was any crashed ones. He goes, I didn't see them. He goes, I didn't I didn't personally see any crashed saucers there. Yeah. And they were all different shapes, too. Right. That's right. But he called it the um, something about the variety pack or something. He made a he made a comment years ago. He says it's almost like they had the variety pack, you know, he, he, right. he's very nonchalant about it, but he knows how serious that is. You know, it's like, I mean, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's kind of like we had the theory uh, a couple of years ago that uh, alien craft, uh, whether they be from one non-human intelligence or more, um, had different models for different purposes. Right. Kind of like how we have trucks and cars for different purposes. Um, so I wonder if they're all from the same non-human intelligence, the one he saw, or if he had any information in regards to that. No, that, that no, that unfortunately he, he's actually very, he's actually very, very, um, he, he also questions the information that they made him read in the briefing documents. He still has reservations about that. And I guess, I guess over the years, he's given it a lot of thought. And says, you know, it's it's so difficult to wrap your mind around a lot of the things that was written, a lot of the stuff that was written in there. He says the only thing he could validate, we, we all know this. He said this publicly many times. The only thing he could validate is what he touched, what he actually yeah. physically handled, which was the reactor and the 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 way the reactor reacted with the components inside the craft because he was able to go inside the craft at one time so that was refer was was referenced those things were referenced in the project galileo files of the briefing documents he says that did all make sense he said but the information regarding project sidekick looking glass the uh, zeta reticuli origins of these potential creatures the um something else about the uh the history you know something about uh the the origins of humanity that we were a product of of 65 corrections over many many years and that we were containers and that something there was uh, there was uh, uh information about religion and certain things about that he says you know there's no way to validate any of that information and he says a lot of that sounded like crazy information so was that purposely create would they would they write purposely in that type of way just to throw him off just to or to, to misinform him so that it would not provide him the right he's very very on the edge with that he he has a lot of difficulty with that a lot of people have come at him with it and he says look i i'm just relaying what i read he says i'm not right. saying you know, I'm, I'm only relaying it doesn't mean I believe it. He says, right. relaying, this is what the document said. And that's it. Right. It's, right. So yeah, we do have a question for you from the chat room from Brian sure. Jackson. Did Bob um, clarify whether the propulsion parts in the lab had to be reinstalled for test flights? Or were the parts he worked on possibly from an, another similar craft? Yeah, that's a good question. Those are good questions. I'm, I'm glad people are paying attention because that makes that those are people that are paying attention saying that. That's great. The wow. the reactor that was in the lab was a separate reactor. There was a reactor in the craft. So it's really important to note that there were two reactors. Where the reactor that was in the lab came from was unknown to him. Okay. So he did not know which other craft they got it from. So this is really right. important. Uh, the sport model, the craft that he did work on, had a missing amplifier on the main level. So the 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 amplifier, so if, if we were all sitting in those three seats that are in the craft looking forward, the, 
the amplifier to the right was missing. It had been cut out with a plasma cutter at the bottom and had been removed out of the craft. That was the amplifier that was in the lab. So it was not in the craft, it was in the lab. The lab also had an emitter, which is those cylindrical four foot by two foot cylinders that are on the bottom of the craft. The problem with that is that there were three cylinders in the craft. So that, that emitter came from somewhere else. And he wasn't privy to know too much. It was very, like he, he, he's often said this publicly, it was very, very, um, it was a very uncomfortable work environment. You cannot really ask too many questions. You cannot really want to investigate too much. You would be uh, immediately kind of uh, barked at if it was a security person. Uh, he was only able to speak to uh, Barry, which was his lab partner. He also had the opportunity to speak to another scientist named Rene, which would come, he would come in and out every so often in the lab and meet with him and Barry. So he says Rene was the only person he's ha he had other conversations with, but even that were very controlled conversations, meaning you don't want to go too far because you're scared that if you ask the, 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 the wrong question, they might say it to somebody and then somebody's going to come and see you and be like, you know, you're not supposed to do that. So very, very, um, very, very uh, strict environment. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, we do have some images that you have been posting on Facebook yeah. as well as uh, on your Project Gravitor uh, page. You know, I get so, in trouble every time I post those things. My team hate it when I do it on my uh, own. They always like... We like it. <laughs> you, know, you know, and, and they're like, you, you, you're posting too many pictures. I'm like, no, I'm not. People want to see this, you know, so... Yeah, you're I drumming like, up interest. That's right. So I'm uh, interested. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. So what we're going to do is br bring the pictures up so people can see them. Yeah, and you probably. can describe uh, how you created them, yeah. uh, the perspective of each image. Sure. This is, well, obviously, here's the sport model. This is the infamous sport model, uh, the flying saucer that Bob worked on. Uh, this is the main hangar. We call it the main hangar because the sport model was located in what they called the main hangar because there was nine hangers, but the one where the sport model was located was slightly wider. So the other ones were a little smaller. And this information was relayed to him from Barry. So this, you're, you're in the main hangar, you're seeing the sport model there, uh, you're, you're seeing a work so table. Cool. There is a uh, plasma cutter to the right, that black and white, black and red, uh, piece of equipment there's a generator the the yellow generator that you see there there's a there's the tripods with the the two halogen lights there was yeah. five of those all around the craft and uh, those are all models like these are all individual models we create everything you see there was created by my team that's right so everything it's is amazing all the, yeah the all detail. the assets yeah the detail we, yeah, we created yeah, these true. little stairs well, this is really old. This is a really, these are pretty old renders. Like that right there. Like, this is a, like the this, Tektronics. That's, yeah, we, we that's did amazing. this. Yeah, we actually, and if I, it's too bad you can't zoom because I actually had and the date. looks worn I and I, used. I, you know. I have a February, oh, hold on. I have a February 1989 date on the top left there on the screen. I did it on purpose because I wanted to make sure that was accurate to the era. So yeah. I think yeah, on the well, top it's, left, it'll, it's, it'll it, say it definitely date. is. Yeah, that's, awesome. that's that's very, very cool. We spent a lot of time making the oscilloscope. It was it was something we wanted to get right. And Bob was very specific about it, too. He says, you've got to make sure he gave us the, the brands of the equipment that were there. So we, we, we followed the, the, that very well. Yeah, we did a lot of research. Detail was yeah. Phenomenal. So and these are old. I mean, what you're looking at here, this is a render from quite a while ago. Um, the lights. The, the ceiling, I'm, I'm looking at it and wait till you guys see the, the final problem. I mean, the, the, the ceiling 
of the hangar is so much more intricate now because we have the air vents, the the we we put the the true mercury vapor lights up in there. There there was a lot of things that we did in steps. So yeah. the, there's the crane, the, the 15 to 20 uh, 20 ton crane that's up there. The uh, infamous number 41. If you look on the wall on the back, there was a number 41 written in black with a white circle around it that was uh exactly where it was located that was the sun and he doesn't know what that meant never knew what that meant by the way so although number 41 was clearly printed on the wall he did not know why there was a number 41 there's a lot of speculation out there uh and we bob and i both don't like speculation because it right. could lead it could lead to the wrong information. A lot of people say, oh, that's because it's S4 and this is the first hangar. So 4-1, you know, but, you know, it says four, it didn't have a lot of people thought it was a 4-1, but it wasn't. It was a, a 41. And so we, we and by the way, it's also S4 with no dash. A lot of people put a, a, a hyphen, a hyphen, you know, like S hyphen four. It's S4. There's no hyphen in there um also the also the um the equipment inside the main hangar had the number 41 marked on them so anything that was in that hangar belonged in that hangar it could not be transferred over to the adjacent hangar i think i think that was for security it was a security protocol uh, or some type of structure that they had at s4 okay next picture uh, this is just this is just uh, we were i was so proud of the team when they came up with this little these stairs because that's exactly what was it looked like you know bob i remember saying to me he goes you know those those mobile stairs that you see at home depot he goes well something like that but a little bit you know more 80s it was sil like, it made of metal and we recreated it um and this this again it's a while ago but it was perfectly almost to the height of the interior of the entrance to the craft so that when you were standing on that on the top platform it, imagine a six foot person walking and stepping onto the craft you could see how incredibly low it is because right. it's 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 slanted it's a disc shape right and there's the uh american there's a reversed american flag that was to the left of the uh of the of the entrance and he said it was a sticker about nine inches wide and the reason why he remembers that he said is because he stood onto the craft and put both his hands on the craft like you know he's like he's got them like that and he put his left hand on the flag and he extended his hand and he said it was the length from my thumb to my my pinky finger and i remember that and he goes, and I looked over to the left and a security guard was kind of sitting there staring at him with this frown. And he, and, and Bob looked at him and kind of like smiled saying, I'm allowed to go in here. You're not, you know, it's kind of, kind of just because he says he always hated their, their demeanor. They were always so serious at S4. And so, and, and that, that flag was a mystery for the longest time. He even didn't know why there was a reversed yeah. American flag on the craft. I mean, he says, look, he goes, all I can tell you is it was there. You know, it, I can, I can just report there was a flag on the craft, you know? So, uh, it, it's obviously, you know, it's America. We put a sticker on it, it's now ours, but right. The obvious, claim. Yeah. You know, but yeah. obviously not, not no. made for us so yeah. yeah this is the entrance uh there was uh, there was never any door visible uh to the craft he never saw it uh so whatever you see here is ha what he saw uh the main floor you could see the main floor but there's like a little lip that looks to the bottom of the craft there's like a little opening to the bottom he says that is exactly how it was it's it's literally what you see there is exactly what he saw the 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 entrance very narrow uh, i said have you did you ever think that they had a door somewhere that they ever maybe 
misplace it. He says, I have no idea. He says, I never saw it. Even when the craft was outside, when he saw it being tested, uh, the door was closed, but he never saw the door. Like it was didn't look like there was a door. So I don't know. It's it's that's something he doesn't know. That's just a just just a cool render that we decided to do of the craft oh, wow. levitating into the hangar. The reason why we did that is because we thought, well, they have to get this thing out of the hangar to test it, right? right? Mm -hmm. So somehow somebody they're not gonna. It, it was sitting on its belly, by the way. It was not. It was not on on anything that could be movable. You know, a lot of people thought it was on rails or it was maybe on sitting on something that they could move around. No, it was straight on the on the uh, hangar floor. So we we this is an assumption because he never actually saw them take the craft outside when they did the Omicron test. So this is just creative liberty of thinking, all right, well, look, maybe the thing could levitate indoors and they could just, you know, fly it out. Because otherwise, I have no idea how they would do that. This is, uh, well, these are the, the three seats mm -hmm. inside the craft. This is uh, just, just also, Bob was, the night, there was a one night where I finally presented him the seats. Because we we had worked really hard on recreating the seats, we had followed yeah. instructions, and and it was a it was an evening. I remember I I called him. Oh. I said, Bob, I, we we finalized the seat, oh, wow. and uh, so we did a Zoom oh, call, man. and I I've had this recorded, and I finally put the seat up on the screen, and Bob looks at it and just goes, Oh my God! He go I remember him saying. You got it. You did it. That's that's it. He goes and he kept looking at it and he kept going, look how creepy it looks. You know, he was he he goes, I remember the creepiness of that seat because he goes, it was so small. I knew it wasn't for us. You know, and he goes, it just it had it had this creepiness to it. And I I guess we 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 certainly got the design because it it really made it really, it really hit him when he saw it. So we're really happy about that. Hmm. These are the three seats in the center of the craft. Uh, Little people. Unfortunately, on the left side of this, you don't see. You could kind of see the outline of the uh, uh, amplifier that's missing there. Unfortunately, hmm. the, the shadows on it. But you see the reactor in the center there, hmm. and there's the waveguide, which is this pipe that comes from the ceiling that is to be applied on the top of the reactor. So that's really like that center of the craft in the, on the main level. Oh, so that thing, that's, those two things are supposed to touch each other. Yeah, the, the pipe, the, the tube that you're seeing, that's kind of like, you don't see where it's connecting because it's connecting all the way to the top of the ceiling there. Mm -hmm. uh, that pipe, it's it's what he calls the waveguide. Wave guide. It, 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 it goes up or down and it's supposed to, it, it kind of, latches onto the hemisphere of the reactor so as soon as the um pipe touches the hemisphere they then activate the reactor and the gravity field of the reactor i'm gonna keep i'll, I'll keep calling it a gravity field but it's whatever field it was creating which we believe is anti-gravity so the gravity field that it's creating is then channeled through the waveguide Okay. And the guide goes right into the ceiling of the craft. The structure of the interior of the craft, there are archways. There are 12 archways that do the whole turn of the, the whole interior of the craft. And that gravity wave is then flowing through the archways. It is then amplified somehow through the amplifiers that are uh, uh, right next to the, the seats that gravity field is amplified and then sent down to the emitters that are on the lower level. Those are the cylindrical. Uh, right. And that's, and those emitters can swivel at 180 degrees wherever they want. There's three of them. So, and they basically are the, the, the guides to where, to how they're, how the craft is going to move. So if, if it's gonna if it's gonna lift off the ground, you only need 
you would have two of those emitters flip basically uh rotate so that they're pointing outwards it would be standing on one and it just lifts the, the craft uh in the air and oh. then however the craft has to move is a, 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 from what i'm understanding it's the emitters are being moved and the craft can move around that's at low power at it when the craft goes into full uh full full power mode which is the delta mode the three emitters are all pointed to the middle so they're all pointed in the center of the of the disc on the bottom and the craft is then rolled over on its side and it moves belly first to whatever destination and and realistically it's not actually moving to destination it's just snapping there it's just it's opening up space time so we, we we i think i think humans have a long way to go before we understand that part yeah right yeah so this is the door on the outside of the base yeah, of I, S4. i'm embarrassed to even show this this is a horrible render compared to wait that you see what we've got now like this is this is good but wait that you, this is the little door oh, it, that looks pretty good though Oh I God! Can't wait to see what you got now. Though. Oh, but, yeah, wait, that looks good, wait, though. wait that you see what we got. It's like next level. So, um, nice. uh, when you when you look at the facility, the S four is in the side of this little hill, uh, right by Papoose Lake. And the when I say the facility is where you see these hangar doors that are kind of camouflaged into the side of this hill, right near Papoose Lake the entrance is kind of, it, you have to kind of walk around there's a little nook in the hill uh you could see it through google earth and there's a there's a door there and that's there's a it's a hidden door mm -hmm. obviously not visible from satellite nor air uh and you're basically looking at you're basically in the, in this nook and there's a door and that's the door that leads inside of s4 wow and and on this render, the camera is not there, but there's an actual there's a white security camera to the right of the door, and it it basically was clear that there was some type of security there because there was a, a white security camera outside. Yeah. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Well, yeah, this is uh, I don't know if you yeah, obviously you guys can't see my mouse, but yeah, so. You've got Papoose Lake there. Uh, you've got the road leading to Papoose Lake, which is uh, a pretty important piece of the puzzle because if there isn't anything there, why is there a road that leads to Papoose Lake? Okay, that is a big, why is there a road there? Okay, now... Right. The road only leads to Papoose Lake, and you do not really see much after that. But there, uh, there is evidence of an of a road. I will not show it because I promised somebody I would not. But there is somebody who has done amazing work and has actually identified it very well, actually. And hopefully, he will come forward and show his work. I was blown away with it. Very clear, very well done research and was able to show that there's an actual road that goes straight to that hill. So I, I can't unfortunately reveal that because I promised him that I he, he's got to get the, the credit for that work. But all I could, and, and where I wrote S4 here is that little hill, which is a pretty small hill. That's, that's where the base is hidden in. This is on another angle, so this is going completely the other side. And uh, you're basically looking at a little piece of Papoose Lake to the left, to the right, sorry, to the right. And the uh, the hangar doors are basically where the, the arrow is pointed. That, that little hill is where S4 is located. This is just a little bit of a clear image. You see Papoose Lake, you still see S4 there. And it's it's probably the most guarded location I would say once was and still is, by the way, one of the most guard location, guarded locations in the world. OK, 
This is another aerial view. Uh, amazing stuff. People people get to, 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 to take pictures sometimes if they get to fly close by. So you have Groom Lake all the way to the top left, and you see the Papoose Mountain Range that separates Papoose Lake and Groom Lake. That mountain range there, that's the Papoose Mountain Range. And obviously, then you've got the Yucca Flat, which is closer to the bottom of the picture, where there's this big, you could see a big uh, landing strip there next to the Yucca Flat. There's like a, a landing mm -hmm. strip. And that's where they, uh, from what I understood, that's where they test the, the drones. The military sends out their drones from there. They send them out to, uh, you know, wherever, and they bomb the shit out of whoever they have to, which is that apparently where they do that. <laughs> Janet Air, everybody knows that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Janet Air, that's the that those are the the seven thirty seven jets, the Boeing seven thirty seven jets that fly out of uh, that still fly out of uh, Las Vegas to uh, Area fifty one. I was actually there not long ago, and they're they're still there. You could go, you can, from Las Vegas Boulevard. There's an area there that you can actually park your car and walk to the fence, and you're like really, really close to the Janet Jets. They're they're right there. There's they're, they're, they don't hide. They're they're really really easy to to spot. Are any of them civilian workers, or are they all uh, military? They're, you think? There's most, I would say most of them are civilian. So, I would actually, yeah. Can you imagine that? I mean, they must get paid a lot. I don't know. Just to have to be carted yeah. by an airplane to their job and then have to be. I took, yeah, yeah, I took this, this picture here. I took it from my hotel room when I was in Las Vegas. So I, oh, I just, wow. I just looked outside and I said, holy shit, there's a Janet jet right there. I called Bob. And I said, Man. Bob, I got a Janet jet right outside the, the right outside my window. He goes, well, take a picture. <laughs> you know, so I did. So that's that's the picture I took. And that's exactly where they're they're at. They're they're basically there. I saw the people. I actually woke up early to go see what they were going to do. And they, there was a whole bunch of people working on them. There was two vans that showed up early in the morning and people started loading up in the planes. And they left, and I thought, "Oh, look at that! It's 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 out in the open. I mean, there's nothing. They don't hide about that. It, there's nothing hiding there. You just don't know what their names are. You know, you don't yeah, know." We, who we do have a question in the chat from Snoops in One Hundred. Uh, since they use buses for the workers, why do they use airplanes too? Well, the planes are uh, meant to fly them from Las Vegas to Area Fifty One. So they're they're flown to Groom Lake with the Boeing, and then once they're there on 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 at the base, then then I would not be able to tell you all the different types of methodologies that they're going to use to to go. I mean that's huge location by the way. So right. they probably have buses or trucks or cars. I mean they probably even have helicopters out there. I I, I suspect they must have that. So there must be a lot of different methods for them to get around once they're at Groom Lake. And everybody I must have a security uh, clearance in order for them to move around, depending. But in order for them to actually get to Groom Lake, most of them are flown in. And there are, the, 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 the person who's asking the question is absolutely right. There are people who are brought in by bus um, those buses come in from the nearby towns around there. So, I mean, you've got, uh, you've got the 375, the extraterrestrial highway. There's a, there's an, inter, in, uh, there's, a, a junction area there where the buses sometimes do stop and there, the, there's government employees will, will leave their cars there and will load into the bus and then they they drive to the back gate of area 51 and drive in but i would i would suspect that the majority of them are flown in this is just the hallway and and again these are they're nice renders but i can't wait for you guys to see the new ones so Same. Uh, i'm excited about it yeah this is this is what the infinite like I, I, I call it the infinity hall the infinity hallway because Bob said it like looked like it never ended. 
you know, and this is this uh, dimly lit uh, bowling. The lower part was like this bowling green cinder block, very eerie hallway, very quiet. Okay. Um, and the, the, the top part where there's like the cinder blocks are green, but the top part is, is just uh, just regular uh, super rock plaster. And it's mm -hmm. it had like a light, very, very light uh, green tone to it. Um, wooden doors. There was there were doors on each side. On the left side is where you would have the propulsion lab to the left. And then you would have every single hanger. So there would be a door to every hanger that lead from the hallway that leads into each hangar on the right side. There was the, pro, there was the briefing room. There was the, uh, washroom. There was a extra type of, I guess, another type of briefing room. There was a cafeteria where they were allowed, they, they were allowed, you know, they, he would obviously be allowed to go to the washroom or the cafeteria there. You're not, you're not prevented to do that, but you're always escorted by security. So you're you're he said you're constantly somebody's constantly breathing over your 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 you're like they're constantly right next to you. So he says, even when you go to the washroom, it's annoying because they're they're there. So you can't really do anything, you couldn't really do anything at S4 without having security right by your side at every step. Well, this is the infamous uh Identimat 2000. This is the hand the the, the bone scanner. Uh wow. this is the bone a bone scanner room which is it part of the entrance of of the of the base and this is where bob would and dennis his superior would put their hand on the bone scanner it would light up the card would be there takes his card it would obviously uh authorize him takes his card and then there's a set of double doors there's a security panel there he had to swipe it was a, a card with a mag swipe a mag stripe, sorry, and he would swipe the card and then would get access to the uh, to the facility. And the card gave him access to the um, the card gave him access to to get through the double door, to get through into the propulsion lab and into the main hangar. And how does that scan your hand? It, I, what it does is you put your hand there, and it, there's mm -hmm. a bright, there's a bright light now. This machine mm -hmm. has now become way more popular in, you know, now people know about it. Uh, this machine apparently would measure the length of the bones in your hand, which apparently are as unique to each and every one of us as are our fingerprints. Huh. So as soon as you would put your hand there, uh, it would read, it would immediately identify you as who you are and would give you your security ID card. Uh, these By machines- bone length. Pardon? By bone length, that's interesting. Oh that yeah, bone length, yeah. Okay. Which, 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 is, which is incredible because is. You know, one of the things that I will say, because I've heard this a million times over the last couple of years, is uh, the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind actually has a scene and the movie of Close Encounters of the Third Kind was done in the late 1970s. There is a scene of two people walking, and there's this machine there where there it's actually in the movie. And somebody puts his hand there, the light turns on, he gets his card, and then he uh, he goes into this secured area. So when Bob came up with this story, well, sorry, came up with the the Identimat story, people didn't believe him. When it came out finally that yes, it's true, uh, the that at the Tonopah test range they did have these machines back in the 1980s, especially for the the the, the stealth fighter project. There was a lot of people who went on Google and found out that you know because Google really existed in 1988, by the way, right? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember Google in 1988. Sure. Yeah. Right. That's Right. On, on my IBM XT. <laughs> exactly, on right? My KND like 16, Commodore 64. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so uh, they were, there's a lot of people who said, well, you see, he lied about it. It was in the movie Close Encounters. He knew that that that, that machine existed. Now, my biggest argument to that, and uh, the, my biggest argument to anybody who says that, 
being from being born in the 70s, growing up in the 80s, is yes, it's true. That machine was in close encounters of the third kind. It was seen as a security machine to get into this secure place. But nowhere did it say that it measured the bones in your hand. Right. And the fact that Bob knew that the machine measured the bone then the bone length of your hand that information was really not available back then. And so I challenge any one of today's Google maniacs to go back in time to 1988 and not have Google and not have a phone and not have the internet and not have anything and get me that information it, from a classified location. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, let's be realistic. He did not have that information. He knew the information because he was there. That information was not public, period. Right. Yeah. Okay, we have a picture of the disc outside. Yeah, this is, a again, an old render. We got so many cool renders, guys. You, I can't so wait real. to talk to you. Um this is this is a, a render we were we were messing around with terrain. Uh, the terrain that we have there is it's good, but we've got way better now. Um, it's it's just to show the, the the quality of Unreal, and this is again like I'm I'm not even kidding when I say I look at this render and I give it like a two on ten. Okay, wait that wait that you see what we got. It's 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 gonna blow your mind. Nope. Yeah, that's just that. That's actually the first trip I ever I ever went out there with to meet Bob. I went to his house. That's me and him at his house, and we spent two full days, literally going through every single inch of the craft, and I mean inch by inch. It was a it was a big job. We were going through. We we were talking about materials, densities, thicknesses. Uh, dimensions, heights, colors, choosing the right tonalities, the textures, the the grain, the 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 sounds that things would make if you walked on them or knocked on them. We really went through like a lot, and that was my first ever trip with them. And after that trip, my team and I came up with a 378 page book on the craft. By the way, wow. Yeah, oh. which I still have at the office. Yeah, we have a question from the chat room for you, Luigi. Sure. Um, I'm aware of 11 people who worked at the Papoose facility. Has Bob mentioned the validity of others? Bob, Bob said that there were a total of 20. From what from what Bob was told, there were a total of 22 people working at S4. Uh, he he only knew of that he that he interacted with was Barry Castillo, which was his lab partner, Renee, which he occasionally was able to speak to, uh, the nurse at the nurse station, and a few of the security guards that he interacted with, and obviously Dennis Mariani, which was his superior. That's it. He never had the opportunity to communicate to anybody else. He he. He was able to see them. He was able to hear them. You know, they would they would talk amongst themselves. Like if they they were in pair, they were paired. But he couldn't he couldn't talk to them. He was not allowed to to talk to them. Yeah, that's just a fun picture that I we we did of Bob when he was in Montreal. That was that was at the end 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 of our shoot. We were there for like seven full days. Bob was tired at this point, and we we had. You know those traditional, what do you call those? Uh, I can't remember that the name of those those movie. You know, like you know, you say action. Yeah, I can't remember the name, but anyway. So I, I wrote I I wrote that I wrote Project Gravitor scene S four take one fifteen roll fifty one. You know, those are just like just for fun. I said let's just take a cool picture, and that was that was uh, at the end of our Montreal shoot. We spent seven days shooting with Bob 
in Montreal interviews and green screen um, shots. So we're going to be able to take Bob. We're going to you're, you're gonna actually you're going to see Bob Lazar at S4 because we're able to bring that into the unreal environment now. So cool. Oh yeah, this is this is this is how it started. This is this is li literally how it started. Um, the what do you call it? This was at the very very beginning. I had to come up with some type of a layout, just conversations with Bob, and this was the first first. I, I laugh at this. I I posted it because I I remember looking at this going, oh my god, did we ever come a long way? This was just at the very beginning. We came up with a 2D put together, you know, is that what the hangar looked like? And it started off with this. And boy, did it ever change over, over the time. Yeah, these are just extra pictures, just designs that we did. The craft, obviously. Okay, now I can the reactor. Yeah, that's the reactor. You could see that the the reactor there. You could see the you can actually see it uh, that pipe there. That's like kind of oh, in front of seat, and it's just about to go on top of the hem the hemisphere is made transparent, so you could see the interior components. And you've got the tower. You've got the element one fifteen. That's the triangular piece that's you could see there, and that's that's what the reactor looked like. So that gives you a, a good idea of how the, the functionality of the gravity reactor. And this is, these are all from uh, some of these uh, renders that you're looking at from inside the craft. These are actually from Blender. Uh, they, were, they were done in Blender. Uh, some of you might know that some of the stuff comes out a little bit better in Blender than in Unreal in some cases. So some of these were done in Blender. Uh, we're now officially doing all our renders out of unreal we we managed to really up our game in unreal so the these renders are good but the the, the ones that we're, we're we're pulling out now are are spectacular oh yeah with yeah. unreal 5 it's, yeah, it's, it's incredible nine day. Nine, yeah uh luigi uh live light said uh you're gonna <laughs> have to release that 378 page craft document as a book <laughs> well, the there is a book in our project, Project Gravitor. If you go on our website, one of our future project, one of our future products is a book. So you you could certainly say you you can certainly bet that that will come public for sure. Absolutely, you'll you'll have that. So that's the element one fifteen right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, that's the element one fifteen right there. That's element one fifteen sitting right by the tower of the reactor that's usually hidden by the hemisphere of the reactor that's a beautiful little render i like i like i particularly like this one that's just the top of the reactor yeah that's the waveguide again you could see it applied on top of the uh, top of the hemisphere on top of the hemisphere now yeah that's oh. just another angle to show, you know. Everything is so clean. There's no wires. There's no so you know it's not human just because there's no there's no there's wires nothing. everywhere and it's clean. There's absolutely yeah. nothing in there. It's it's like all solidly molded. Right? Absolutely, it's, like, it's completely. It's like, bare it's like one. It's like one piece. It's so just like how, one molded piece. If if humans pilot this craft. Uh, you know and take it out for test flights how do they how do they control it how do they pilot it yeah, good question. no i no idea that the 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 most the the thing that bob always said was there was nothing in there there were no control it was no control panel there were no levers there was no there was no there was nothing there was absolutely nice. nothing that you're 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 looking at a very bare bones environment but if you really think about it sometimes you know if we go back to 1988 and i think we can all do that what as we're talking here uh, back in 88 things things had like even our remote controls from our tvs or 
um, even anything that we had had a lot of like, you know, those little, they, they felt like little rubber buttons on, or hard plastic buttons on something and everything was very analog. And, and now today mm -hmm. our phones are bare bones. I mean, there's nothing on them. It's just a flat surface. And if the battery's dead on our phone, it's just a flat bare bones. What, what, what you know, nothing. So it's very possible that this that these that this environment does more than what we can see here but he never got to see anything this is again this just just extra pictures of the waveguide going on top of the uh hemisphere and that's there that's myself chris my 3d master and cinematographer and Bob, that's when we were out in Oregon by Crater Lake. We 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 shot a beautiful interview of Bob out there. That was really a really fun time. Bob looks pretty much the same. Yeah, that's that's actually a re, a, a replica that we built of the reactor. We actually built the thing for real, and that's Bob taking a picture in front of it. And we were really we we love these pictures. It looks great on these shots. And uh, when Bob saw when Bob saw the replica of the reactor, he said, "My God!" He goes, "It gives me shivers. It almost feels like it's going to work." So, yeah, that's us working in Montreal at the studio. We were he literally sat side by side with us, looking at every possible step uh, of and correcting us and telling us what to do and. That's just us on the dry lake when we shot the uh, DeLorean uh, trailer. So that's that's how we kind of we were following the car. We had camera two camera people following the car, and the, the car was just blasting as fast as it could on the desert. It was amazing. Right. That's just me and Chris in front of Area Fifty One. That's actually not too long ago we yeah. went out there. Yeah, that, I just seen your short that you did where you're standing out in front of there. Yeah, and you were it was uh, and you're talking about Project Gravitar. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, I got to back out for this one. Yeah, that's the Waveguide Terminator. I think I posted that today. If I'm not wrong, yes. that was post. yeah, that's my today post. Yeah, that's the Waveguide Terminator. That's that little antenna on top of the craft, and that. That's the continuity of the waveguide. So the, 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 the gravity wave is then extended outward of the, peri the perimeter of the actual body of the craft and then is flowed back towards the bottom of the craft. And it creates, if you look at it from the top, it's like a donut. But if you're yeah. looking at it from, from the side, it looks like a heart. It's like a heart-shaped uh, mm -hmm. gravity field, if you want to call it. Yeah. How tall is that? Um, bike oh, in the middle. You know, that's a really good question. I would have to go. I, I don't remember off off uh, memory. I would have to go and check it out in the in the in the actual software. We can measure it and probably. I think I, if I'm not wrong, it was like, I think it was like 18 inches. I if I'm not wrong, I I, I'm saying that, but I could be a little bit off. It looks far bigger. From that image. Yeah, from the image, but it's actually not that that big. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So we have gone through all the uh, photographs that he has posted to date that I could find. Awesome. So we want to thank you for, for describing them and explaining your perspective yeah. and Bob's on all those images. My pleasure. Um, I think it's giving people in the chat room uh, a run for their money in regards to uh, information. So thank you. Oh yeah, yeah, it's they're great. definitely excited. I mean, no, we do. We we did lose a couple of our panelists, but they are saying that they're about to return shortly. No problem. Um, could you go a little bit more into your virtual reality gaming aspect? of your yeah. production 
Well, it, again, it well, there's there's a big difference between when you're making the cinematics for a film versus the virtual reality part, because the virtual reality part, everything counts because you can't hide anything at this point. Like cinematics, you know, we could trick the camera, make it look even more beautiful and like like they do in real cinema. But when it comes to virtual reality, it's you're there. So you're now living the experience depending on how you're going to experience it. So whether you're going to be using your mobile phone and just walk around with your mobile phone, which you could do, uh, or have, you know, MetaQuest goggles on and have a super high powered computer and have, you know, the, the, the quality of, of the imagery will get just better and better over time. So the, the experience gets better with the equipment you use, obviously, and, and it's more realistic. And you'll be able to, again, when I say interact, it's everything. So you walk in, you could turn the lights on or off. If you want it to look really, really eerie in there, turn off the lights, it, it will look eerie. You know, you'll only have the fire exit sign that'll be on. It's, it's kind of gloomy. You turn it on. Now you've got, you know, these lights on. You, you could go into the hangar and literally shut down the hangar lights. And when you do that, you've got, you've got some security lights that are on. So by those security lights, it gives the craft this little shimmer on and it makes it really creepy because you're in this big hangar with this flying disc. So that's really cool. Um, you can go outside and something that we joked around about the other day, and this is, this is no kidding. Our environment is literally 10 miles wide. So you can, if you were to put your goggles on and walked for 10 miles, it's actually going to go, you're, you're actually going to be in the environment. You're actually going to walk past Papoose Lake. You can go all the way around the mountain. So it's, wow. it's, it's really, really cool. Really, really cool. Well, looking forward nice. to that. That'll be really cool. Okay. Well, we got Odessa back, so that's good. Odessa. Yeah, Nas is dealing with the uh, internet guy out there at the pole, so I'm here. Okay, I do have a question from uh, a little bit uh, farther back in our interview. Um, if anyone has seen the underground facility that the Umbrella Corporation uh, has in the movie Resident Evil, I'm guessing S4 and Area 51 would have something similar. Who knows? That's yeah. yeah, who knows? That's not that's not something that Bob ever saw. So I mean right. who knows? Who knows what's on what's what's possible? Okay, that was a question I had to address. Um yeah, Liv, I got the other one already. Um so I have a question for you though. Uh yes. whenever how many people were in that whenever in one of the craft whenever Bob was working on it like uh you, you know people watching them you know, keeping tabs on them I mean, and what kind of um because it just looks so when so he went smart. inside when he yeah. went inside yeah when he went inside the craft when he went inside the craft there were there was a to including him there were a total of four people including Bob so it was it was him and his lab partner, Barry, that were in the center of the area where the reactor sat. Right. And there was another team, uh, two people working by the um, one of the archways okay. that was right in front of the seats. And it that they had to be like crouching down because yeah. it, so... And they they actually managed to get the the archway transparent because you know I don't know if you're familiar but it, one of the archways became completely transparent at a certain point and that's when he was inside the craft and oh. he says that team managed to make one of the archways completely transparent and so he could see inside the hangar and suddenly a um, one third of that archway in area became a blue screen with these black symbols that popped, but that showed up and that caught his attention. Uh, so there was, there was him and Barry by the reactor 
and these two people that were, I guess, I don't know, maybe 20 some feet away. Yeah. Okay. We do have a question we need to address in chat. It's from an S I M Y T. Uh, how far from hangar, how far from the hangars in area 51 is S four? Well, S4 is the hangers. Yeah, S yeah, that's right. That the hangers are part of S4. Yeah. yeah I, I think they meant how far bad. away is S4 located from Area 51. Oh, yeah. That's a good it's, it's a it's about 15 miles south. Uh it's kind of like 15 miles south, a little bit southwest of Groom Lake. But you have to drive around like it's basically if you're at Groom Lake and you're looking at a map, if you go on Google Earth and you you could kind of see Groom Lake on the top right. And you'll see if you're at Papoose Lake, just zoom out a little bit and you're going to see the mountain range and you're going to see Groom Lake to your right. You'll see there's a road that kind of leads all around the mountain mountain range and then leads to Papoose Lake. So if you do the if you do the, the mathematical calculation and then you go all the way to that little hillside there, you're at approximately 15 miles. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we are trying not to ignore your questions in the chat, but the conversation doesn't always go the direction of your question. So we appreciate your patience. Um, Odessa, do you have a question? Actually, no, I'm just really enjoying the interview. I'm just listening and learning. Uh, actually, no, wait. Uh, you're hoping to be able to start focusing on the virtual reality thing by maybe April, May, somewhere in there. Um, once you are able to focus on that, any idea how long it might take just so I can kind of get a mental picture? Because I'm really excited about it. Well, yeah, so am I. Actually, so am I. Yeah, uh, I would say I would give us another two and a half months after that uh, to really, really fine tune things. Maybe three months tops. We got to really fine. I want, I want it to be really good. Like I need it to be like top, excellent. excellent. So it's, it's going to become, it's going to, what's going to happen is we'll have it ready. I know how I am. I'm, I'm a perfectionist by the way. So it's going to happen is I'll go in there and I'll be like, wait, we got to make that better. Or I'll, I'll pick out all the stuff I don't like right away. And I'll have a list. I'll be like, no, we got to make that better, make that better, make that look better. <laughs> yeah. So you know how that is, you know, so, oh, yeah. so, so crazy. Like me, I'm the same way. Yeah. So it would, it would probably, it would probably be another two to three months. And that's hoping everything is just perfectly, you know, goes as planned. Which take right. time. I'd rather have Yeah, take a, your time. We want yeah. it stunning. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And we're, I'm I'm just committed. I really, I really, I really want this to be something that anybody goes, wow. You know, I just want people to right. enjoy this. You know, I want people right. to actually and not only the fact that it's area 51 or it's S4, but it's also because it gives us an opportunity to show what the tech can do. That's you know what I was gonna say. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, so it's the demo it's demonstrating what what we could do now with the technology, which is what I consider to be really interesting. Yeah. Right. Me we too. have two quick questions. One from Live Light. Were there any symbols or markings on the craft? No, not at all. Other than the yeah. American flag sticker that somebody put on. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Sorry, the backwards no American way. flag sticker. Like, yeah, rear view, was... like, here we go, bitches, you can't catch us. Like that? <laughs> yeah, and then from TETs, uh, -E did Bob need to wear any special clothes while working with the craft? No, he didn't have to wear anything that had to do with anything to protect him, um, except that when he was first brought to S4, he was uh, given a liquid to drink at the nurse station, which was the medical room at S4, which was which he was told that that would protect him against foreign materials. That's what they said. Foreign and materials. Foreign materials. Yeah, he was. They also tested him for allergies. They 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 drew a a, a grid on his arm and had yeah. different things 
pl- placed on his skin. Oh, I think uh, it was an allergy test. Allergy like test, yeah. yeah. But so that little liquid, yeah. Sorts of stuff. yeah. The liquid gave him horrible, horrible stomach cramps that night. He said it was it was a very, very uh, uncomfortable experience that night. But he says that's it. And then after that. He never had to. He never had to wear any protective, because uh, you know a lot of people say you know any radiation or anything like that. There was, there was nothing. So, huh. um, Live Light says, "Can Luigi come back on the show closer to release date?" Sure. And we say sure. we say yes. Of course. Yes, please. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, people in the chat are really digging what you're saying. Um, awesome. And the work that you put in into it shows that you're trying to remain accurate. And Absolutely. that's what we're pursuing on this channel is accuracy and truth. Um, there's too much fluff and woo out there. So it's really nice to hear that you guys are really focusing on the accuracy of uh, your presentation. Um, uh, let's yeah. go down the line here. Oh, Noss is back. Sorry, Noss. Hey there. Hello. Oh, you had a question. I was, I was still here. I was just you know, listening through it. As a... You got a question for Luigi, Noss? Um, well, not so much a question as just, you know, putting pieces together from the things that you've been describing. I want to cover a couple of those. First, if I am a strategic dominating nefarious overlord running that program for the government, then I'm going to put into their orientation documentation something that they can confirm, followed by a lot of things that slant the opinion that if you confirm that, you believe the rest. And if you believe the rest, we're allied with something super powerful you don't want to piss off, right? (laughs) <laughs> so you get them to believe you're protected from disclosure. Mm. But if you have someone that actually does follow through with disclosure, all the crap you made up makes them look insane. So nobody believes them. <laughs> this is <laughs> basic strategy. All said, yeah. 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 But also with the flag on the entrance of the ship, security personnel aren't being given the specs and the blueprints and everything else that are worked out for these ships. Right. They're walking on cameras. If you change the orientation of flags or stickers that you put by the doors of the vessel, then whatever security camera that they're looking at the entrance of the vessel, uh, this one, it's left side of the door, top, the blue field is in the right Mm. on the sticker. So Mm. left, top, right, here's my code book. This is the craft. This is the hangar that that one's in. Mm. Right. Mm. So they can always match up. That's the interesting. Same thing with the numbers on the walls and the numbers on the machines, but with yeah. the numbers on the machine, I'll take it a step further, is because they are working with exotic particles coming off of these that they don't know the long-term effects on anything in the right. material sciences around them. Right. So if machines that are from a certain area are getting maintenance calls pulled out and brought back, and they notice a series of machines breaking down from that hangar with particular deterioration, they're going to have a clue of something wrong with that ship. Again, that's, this is strategic that's, that's, elements of design. That is excellent analysis. Very, very well. Very well. Yeah, I, I love that. Excellent analysis. Absolutely. Yeah, it should be part of the uh, should be part of our team to to kind of do analytical work. Yeah. Sure. yeah. She said she would love to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. She's um, extremely in love. From Tim Frick in the chat room, he says, from what I understand, the reactor wasn't functioning unless or until it was being tested. Sorry, repeat that. I I didn't understand the beginning. From what I understand, the reactor wasn't functioning unless or until while it was being tested. Well, the reactor... No, the reactor, it's not that it wasn't functioning. The reactor was not turned on. There's, there's, it's, it's about, it's about the proce- the procedure to turn on the reactor. So the, it always works. It's, it's never not, it's never like, um, it's, it's just not turned on. So you can have the reactor sitting there, but it could be turned off and it's not, right. not it's not emitting the gravity field or the, the, let's call it a, 
it almost feels like a force field. Uh, but if you rotate the emitter, you now have an activated reactor and you can't touch it anymore. So right. this was actually a question I personally had with Bob when I first met him because I, I had, and, and to my own personal, uh, I, I was upset with myself because I did not understand it when he had explained it on television or in, in different interviews. So when I asked him, he had to re-explain it to me. And then I, I was like, it's true. You did say that. And I never caught on to it because I always used to think once the reactor is on and this force field is there, well, how do you eventually get to it if it's no longer accessible? Well, you just have to re-rotate the emitter and you turn it off. I didn't know that. So it was it was something right. that I was very happy to to clarify for myself. And I remember thinking a lot of people probably had the same question because once this thing is on, you can't touch it anymore. So it, it, it was important to really get that process figured out. And there's a there's a certain amount of degrees that it has to be turned at in order for right. it to do that. And right. and that also implies the way that the gravity field is then emitted out of the emitter so that it it provides the proper I, I i i guess we would call it strength or focal strength of the gravity field it's it's bending space time at this point i'm kind of like just using my own personal way of it, yeah. uh, of Ooh. describing it and maybe that's not how it actually is measured so i don't know that but yeah Okay, Tim Frick also said, since electronics are affected when UFOs are near cars and such, were they able to use electronics near the reactor? Yeah, they were. Yeah, it's actually interesting that he said he asks that. Yes, they did. They were. So the, there, there were uh, a series of different uh, pieces of equipment that they had inside the lab to, to, to test the reactor, and everything worked. There was nothing that was being affected. You know, like how sometimes we hear that, Everything kind of, you know, the radios in a car will not work or right. everything worked. So there was no uh, and there was what what Bob kept saying was that it was it was very eerie because he said this thing had made no sound. It it emitted no heat and it was producing an incredible amount of power. So he said that was a scary thing. He actually was very he he personally did not enjoy uh testing the reactor uh, because he said he didn't know if this thing would just blow up one day, like, or just maybe not blow up, but maybe do something that could be potentially very dangerous. Right. right. Yeah. So who he knows, said, the that could generate and what that could do. Who knows? You know? Yeah. He said, turn, Look, on, so you turn it on and find out. Yeah. He, he, he actually hmm. said that Sorry, to me fingers. recently. He said, you know, if we had it on the bench straight in front of us. You know, he says, we didn't, he goes, I didn't know if I just took the base of it and moved it this way, if it would screw everything up. You know what I mean? Like he goes, I was just scared of doing anything because it was just too much power. And I just didn't know if I, if I messed around too much with it, if it would just mess with me, you know, and, and that right. makes sense. I mean, you know, that, that goes a long way for me of somebody that is truthful because when you, on for sure. Yeah, because you're you're talking about how you cared about your own personal safety. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily something you often think about when you're coming up with some confabulated lie. You know, right. there was so it 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 really feels very very genuine when he talks about that, and I could I could clearly see that there was definitely a, a concern with uh -huh. handling uh -huh. the, the materials. And I was gonna joke about you know his concern this is the guy that made us his, his own rocket car yeah but at right. the same time at least he knew what how the limitations works. are and how it right worked, you know so that's right he built that's it. right you yes know, yeah. he had no idea so well it's it's, it's funny it's, leads credence to that it, it's funny you say that he he actually <laughs> said that he goes he goes i'm familiar with jet engines he says you know he goes i i've been playing around with jet engines for, for, for the longest time, he goes, but I know how they work. Mm -hmm. He goes, this just didn't make any sense. He goes, it just, it didn't make any, he, he kept repeating, nothing made sense. You know, there was no connections. There was no, and especially back in 1988 and 1989, mm -hmm. like today we can all agree 
that we understand, you know, oh, look, your speaker just turned on because it connected to your phone. That's Bluetooth. You know, like we know what that is. Right. We know we know that we could connect the stuff wirelessly today. It's it's we amazing. had no idea back in the 80s. Yeah, Not we didn't, at all. None of that existed, you know, so <laughs> so that the, the concept of wireless transmission of mm-hmm. these very powerful signals that 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 was not something that we we regularly played with back in the in the late 80s so it, right. it must have been scary yeah at least not in the commercial market right exactly um, well, yeah. if they had if they had the identimat bone scanner in 88 then they had technology that is far more advanced than of course we even I mean, knew of them there's no question they've always they're always ahead of us they're always ahead right. of us Okay, let's go down the panel uh, and take last comments. Um, I'm going to leave uh, Luigi large screen um, yes, so he can answer. Uh, William? Yes. You got um, last comment? Last comment? No, I just just uh, keep keep going, man. I can't wait to I can't wait to watch it. I can't wait to experience it. I can't wait to get get in on it. Awesome. So, so yeah, keep, me too. Keep, keep, you guys keep it up. It. Yeah, I'll be checking. Awesome. All the time. I'll be checking your channel. Okay, and so everybody else too. Remember to um, yeah. subscribe and uh, keep your eye on Project Gravatar. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally agreed. I was going to say we just need a reminder. We want the name of your your latest documentary because everybody knows previous. Everybody knows. Uh, and I also want to know the name of the, the uh, virtual reality project that you're working on. So we can kind of keep an eye on that too. Yeah. Well, it'll be. I just wanted him to reiterate for everybody because a lot of people are here now that weren't at the beginning. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. So Thank it's you. yeah. So the the main project name is Project Gravator. Okay. And that's kind of like it. It embodies everything we're doing regarding Bob Lazar. And the first product that we're coming up with is our documentary film called Lazar: The Original Whistleblower. That's the first thing that's coming out. The VR experience, the game, let's call it the experience, the game. For the gamers out there, we can call it the game. That will be called S4, the experience. And that is going to be coming out a few months after the launch of the movie. And following that will be a beautifully illustrated book. So we're going to have an S4 book that will come out. And that'll utilize these beautiful graphics that we're able to create in Unreal Engine and create a coffee table book so that you could finally have a super cool flying saucer book. Yeah, I didn't know. I'm you know, signing up for a signed copy. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And hopefully, uh, and, I, and I mean this because it was the first thing I wanted to do, and it's ended up being uh, the last thing on the list, we're going to be creating a super high quality die cast model of the of the sport model. Nice. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. And that's going to be last, last product. That's going to be a collector piece. It'll actually include a real element one, like a metal made out of copper element 115 in there uh it'll have everything that you'll see in our project but tangible yeah uh it's so cool okay there I've goes three to, paychecks I, of mine to find yep. the model i know right of it, and there's there is no model at least that i can afford that um looks like the sport model I'm yeah, trying. there 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 was I'm a trying. model that was made back in 1994 by the Testers Corporation. Testers, yes. Yeah. I've tried but, to find that one and it's, it's yeah. I was, I was hoping somebody else would have found it and done it and distributed I've seen it, it again. For, yeah, I've seen I seen it from time to time on eBay. They're out there. Yeah. The 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 only thing about the I mean the Testers is great, by the way. We use the Testers as a as a as a reference all the time. The only thing is that it's 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 a cheap plastic, you know. We yeah yeah, and it, it's and just the like, only one, you know. It's just the that's only that's right. One. Uh, correct, yeah. For so, now, yeah. That's for now, change. for now. So that's we really want to make that leap into, you know, we we you, 
I, I, I've actually made uh, miniaturized models in my professional. I mean, I'm a merchandiser, by the way. I've been doing, I've, I've been making stuff all my life. So I've done professional models of city buses. Uh, I've done professional models of, of products in my past. And I never saw a collector worthy flying saucer ever. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, no. and I, when I mean collector worthy, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, uh, war of the worlds type of thing. Right. I'm talking about of a real story of something real. Yes. Yes. And so I, I said, we got to do it. We got to make this, you know, that we've now got <laughs> the schematics to make it. So let's do it. Let's let, yeah. so that's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's going to be great. Thanks. Appreciate I'm it. Served. Awesome. King Noss, last comment. Oh, yeah. Yes. So, going to start with what sounds like a sidetrack, but totally not. <laughs> um, so, we all know that, like, even naturally, humans have a little bit of echolocation. You know when your voice should be bouncing back off of something. If it's a chiffon curtain, you know, you're going to get that softening and the not a lot coming back. If it's a concrete wall, it's going to be coming back at you. So even unconsciously, we don't really think about it, but we're gauging the way our voice returns to us all the yeah. time. And my question is, did Bob mention to you when the reactor was on, his voice not sounding right on the return? Well, that's actually a good question. I uh, I never asked him that. I'm going to ask him that. That's a very good question. You really should. You really should. Yeah. These are the things I think of. That's a very good question. In fact, gravity bends everything. That's true. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very, very curious. You just, you just kind of sparked something. I gotta, I gotta ask him, because that makes perfect sense. It's true. There, there, there absolutely has to have some type. I mean, hey, it, 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 it it's bending. It's bending. Right. If it's bending gravity, if it's creating gravity, it's bending space time. I mean, it's, it's right. doing something. So yeah, yeah, I'll ask him for sure. I will certainly this, ask. Is, this is kind of a comment on the physics side there is that the gravitational or simulation of gravitational force emitting out would in many cases accelerate the compression waves as they bounce back, increasing the frequency of your own voice that you would hear. It's, it's interesting that you say that. You're right about that. I have to ask him because when they bounced the golf ball you know, they finally, they had bounced a golf ball and it bounced off of it and, and blew a ceiling tile out of its right. place. And, and that kind of goes with what you just said, because it, if you throw it at, let's say, one meter per second, right. it's bouncing back faster. So, right. so that does have some type, that, that there is a logic behind what you just said, where there could be some type of difference there. I'm, I'll definitely ask him. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I don't know. I it, it's I, I'm yeah. sorry that I don't know the answer, but you you kind of that's a great question. I will ask him for sure. Yeah. Um, I got one last. Those. Sorry, I have one last question from the chat from Snoop. Thank you. That's the second time they asked, so thank you. Awesome. Uh, did Bob say anything about finding a cap to wear so the UFO could be controlled by thought? A a what? Sorry to wear like a yeah. visor or a cap. No, no. Actually, there was nothing. It, it, it's funny. He, he literally. He's he's really curious. I mean, he's as curious as we are because I mean, he's more curious than we are because he was there, yeah. and he would love to know how the hell did when they did the Omicron test where they were outside and he said someone was obviously inside the craft when they were doing the low power test. He was standing very close to the security table where there was a gentleman looking at a, UA, a, VHF, a VHF, yeah, VHF radio. And he says, he, he goes, I don't remember the, 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 the frequency, but I do remember looking at it. And he says, that made no sense to me that somebody was sitting in there. He says, because first of all, he would have to be sitting on the floor because he can't fit in the seat. And he says, and whoever was in there, he says, knew how to operate this thing because it, you, you don't just go in there and right. sit there. It doesn't it just happen? Mm -hmm. So he was always curious to know how that happened, but he was never yeah. given that information. 
So who knows what they had? You know, who knows if there was he he you know, who knows if there was other components that were not in the craft when he was given access to the craft? Right. Were, were there were there were there other things there? Something? Wasn't he only given access to the to the reactor room pretty much? He was only given, yeah, he only was able to go into the main level and he peeked through the honeycomb hatchway to look under where the emitters were. He was never given access to the top left, to the upper level where the planar arrays are. He's always wanted to know what was up there. He says, everything I've ever thought of is just an assumption. He says, I did not have access, so I don't know. He says, right. is it possible that there was something that was there that could connect to somebody who's downstairs and he, right. he said it really he it sucks that he doesn't know he just doesn't know yeah right yeah it's too bad we would all love to know that right yeah like, yeah. right yeah, yeah. Yes. but he can't be That's everywhere true. you know you know, yeah he knows what he knows it's, yeah i right. mean that the that 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 the the one thing bob says is it was uh, he keeps referring to the interior of the craft as a very ominous and creepy environment. Creepy. Yeah, creepy. Creepy, creepy, uh, creepy is actually the word he used the most. Yes, he would creepy. constantly say creepy. Yeah. It felt like he says it just didn't feel like we were, were supposed to be there. He, yeah, he goes, it felt maybe weird. we weren't. Yeah, maybe who we knows? weren't. And obviously. Well, yeah. back back no. into that, you know, mentally control, make people afraid to come forward thing. Yeah, yeah. This, this is the menace you get by doing what we want you to. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> right. Well, I want to say this, Luigi. We really thank you for coming on our yes. show today. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Um, thank you guys for having me. Yeah. We have definitely learned a lot. Yeah. I have more than what I already knew, so thank you. Um, right. Yes, thank you. And uh, you're more than welcome to come back anytime on our channel. Yeah, we especially as back on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we we could have have you closer to release. Yeah, if we could have you closer to the release date, sure. that'd be great. And uh, I will get back to you via email or by messenger, and we'll Absolutely. we'll schedule that. Sounds great. Um, we yeah. we were hoping to have Nicole back this evening, but her her cable that provided uh, internet to her house got cut by accident. Oh. So they had to fix it, and That's she'll, she'll be back next week. So she apologizes sincerely for not. Well, you'll say hi. She is so sad she was not here. She's kind of kicking herself right oh, now. Yeah. She <laughs> even tried to go to a friend's house to use their studio to get online so she could oh be my here. God. Wow! Like she really, really wanted tried. to be here. Yeah, you. she so really she tried. Know. Okay. Yeah. Um. So maybe we'll have her on next time. We will okay. definitely have her on next time if everything works out for her. That's great. Uh, when you come back on. Awesome. So it was really great to meet all you guys. It was really yeah, fun. It's real great to meet you. Yeah. It's it's a really great sure. interview, and we thank you very much. Um, all right. From Don't everybody leave. on the panel, we, we want to thank everybody on the panel. We want to thank everybody who watched online and everybody yeah. who participated in chat. The chat and was we, awesome tonight, man. Yeah, we hope to see you next week. And it's from all part. of us on the panel, good night. Please join us next Wednesday night on UFO Man at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. We will be featuring Terry Lovelace and his alien encounter at Devil's Den State Park. We hope to see you there, the UFO Man team.